Just don't try to change the channel or anything. Okay. <laughs> um, women and gender and sexual minorities face various forms of sexism, and we often band together to create movements designed to challenge these sexist double standards. Typically, these movements begin with a group of activists who share a particular identity or grapple with similar circumstances, and who together start to articulate the marginalization they face. Their initial focus will understandably be centered on those double standards that are most relevant to their own lives. Sometimes they'll conceptualize this particular set of double standards as forming a singular type of prejudice, an ism, or a phobia that other people harbor in their minds. And they may focus their activism on raising awareness about the harm that this type of prejudice inflicts um, in an attempt to convince people in the dominant mainstream to condemn such practices. This approach to fighting double standards is often described as single issue activism. In other cases, activists will conceptualize the suite of double standards that concerns them in terms of a gender system, one that's hegemonic, omnipresent, and which subjugates the masses in order to benefit the privileged few. Gender systems are often imagined to consist of multiple isms that are inex in inexplicably linked in such a way that one cannot effectively challenge them on an individual basis. It is often argued that gender systems are far too institutionalized and far-reaching to be reformed, and therefore they must be overthrown or subverted via mass-scale revolution. Now, many debates within feminism and queer activism, especially those related to the issue of exclusion, often pit single-issue activism against the overthrowing the gender system approach, thus creating a false dichotomy. Should we settle for a more moderate, incremental strategy of reducing prejudices on an individual basis, or should we take a more radical strategy of full-scale gender and sexual revolution? I wish to intervene in this debate to propose an alternative view. I would argue that, while clearly different from one another, both the above strategies are anchored in a fixed perspective of sexism and marginalization, one in which activists are only concerned with a finite set of double standards. This concern may stem from activists' first-hand experiences of being marginalized by the double standards in question. Or, if one does not have direct experiences with the double standards in question, the activist nevertheless acknowledges their existence because other activists have previously made awareness about them. While different fixed perspectives, oh sorry, while different fixed perspectives may vary significantly from one another in their analyses of the issue and the specific solutions that they propose to challenge sexism and marginalization, they all share a fundamental problem. They fail to consider the countless double standards that remain outside of their purview. And this results in a host of reoccurring problems that haunt feminist and queer movements. I should also point out which usually I do earlier, but I forgot to. I use the word queer in big, big umbrella sense, like, you know, LGBTQIA+, basically anyone who you might consider to be a gender or sexual minority, okay? Okay, the most obvious problem that stems from only acknowledging a limited number of double standards is that many people's experiences with marginalization will be theorized out of the movement. This can be seen in single-issue activism, where racism and classism have been viewed by some feminists and gay rights activists as falling outside the scope of their organization's mission statements. This has led to predominantly white and middle-class-centric movements, where the concerns of the most marginalized members of these groups fail to be adequately addressed. Furthermore, some double standards take longer to articulate than others. While critiques of traditional sexism have existed in various forms for well over a century, the concept of homophobia and heterosexism as we now know it did not really exist until the 50s and 60s. And the contemporary bisexual movement and its critique of biphobia slash monosexism, and the contemporary transgender movement with its critique of transphobia slash cissexism emerged in the 80s and 90s. The asexual movement um, and its critique of asexophobia is more recent still. When I was writing Whipping Girl in 2005 and 2006, I set out to raise attention about trans misogyny and um, masculine centrism, um, blah, blah, okay, and masculine centrism because I felt that these forms of sexism had little to, ha, had been, sorry, that was a hard sentence for me, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me start at the beginning with that sentence. Okay, so when I was writing Whipping Girl, I know this stuff off the top of my head, I started articulating trans misogyny and masculine centrism because I felt that these forms of sexism had received little to no attention previously. 
All of these more recently articulated forms of sexism have been omitted from past and often present anti-sexist movements that rely on fixed approaches. Given this history, it seems reasonable to suspect that there are many other forms of sexism that currently exist, but which have not yet been articulated or garnered public awareness. In addition to this, sexism and marginalization are not static phenomena. As cultures and movements shift, new sexist double standards may arise. As feminists and queer activists, we should always be on the lookout for novel, unarticulated, and underappreciated forms of sexism and marginalization. And our theories and activism should be flexible enough to acclimate to these newer double standards when they arise or become apparent. In contrast, fixed perspectives, with their limited and predetermined sets of relevant double standards, do not readily accommodate newly articulated forms of sexism and marginalization. When we omit certain forms of sexism and marginalization from our theories and activism, we are not merely excluding those particular marginalized groups from our movements. Rather, more often than not, our lack of consideration for these double standards may lead us to delegitimize these very groups. For instance, on numerous occasions, I've heard trans activists who are unaware of the disability and sex worker rights movements to make ableist, sexualizing, and or anti-sex worker comments um, in their attempts to distance themselves from the stereotypes of trans people as being mentally ill or sex workers. Such disparaging claims not only exclude trans people who are sex workers or who have mental disabilities from trans activism, but they also contribute to the societal marginalization of these other groups more generally. When we base our theories and activism on a pre-selected handful of double standards while ignoring all others, it limits the number of tools that we have to understand sexism and marginalization, thus leading to a less nuanced, if not outright distorted, view of the world. This is highly evident in the countless cis feminists. And by the way, if I say the word cis or cisgender, basically that's, those are um, synonyms for like non-trans or non transgender. So like if you are not transgender, then you're cisgender. So congratulations. <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. So this is highly, I'm talking about these distorted views. This is highly evident in uh, the many cis feminists who are concerned about traditional sexism, but oblivious to cis sexism or transphobia and who therefore relentlessly view trans people, issues, and experiences solely through the lens of male privilege. And by the way, I, I write about this a lot in Whipping Girl. Like, trans people talk about male privilege all the time amongst each other, right? Um, but, like, you can't frame our whole lives in terms of that, like, one form of privilege, right? Um, or those gay and lesbian activists who are concerned with heterosexism, but who are oblivious to biphobia slash monosexism, and therefore only able to make sense of bisexual lives via the construct of heterosexual privilege. As the saying goes, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem will look like a nail. <laughs> Human beings are way too heterogeneous for us to treat other people's experiences with gender and sexuality and sexism and marginalization as though they're proverbial nails that can be dealt in a one-size-fits-all manner. Therefore, we must constantly be seeking to expand our toolkit. In this case, by trying to uncover and understand the heterogeneity of people's experiences and in the myriad double standards they face. Limiting our theories and activism to a small set of double standards often leads to ignorance, but it can also lead to downright arrogance. After all, if we believe that we are fully aware of all the relevant sexist double standards that exist, and that we truly understand that they, how they function, then we will become to fancy ourselves as some kind of authority on the subjects of gender and sexism. Essentially anointing ourselves as omniscient arbiters of what counts as sexism and what does not, and which gender and sexual related behaviors are righteous and which should be condemned. When we become convinced that we have superior knowledge over others, then we will invariably become entrenched in our views, impervious to new ideas and strategies to combat sexism, and reluctant to engage in constructive dialogue with people whose identities and experiences differ significantly from our own. A hallmark of this omniscient arbiter problem is our tendency to presume that particular gender and sexual expressions, identities, or bodies have a fixed meaning built into them one that holds true in all situations and contexts. For example, feminist and queer activists who hold fixed perspectives will sometimes claim that, and this is like a laundry list of things I've heard, people claim, 
Um, they will claim that the color of pink always signifies submissiveness, that feminine dress always turns a person into a sexual object, that heterosexuality is inherently conservative, that BDSM is inherently immoral, that androgyny is the one true form, natural form of gender expression, and or that bisexuals reinforce the gender binary. And by the way, I have a whole chapter about that, the claim that re bisexual people reinforce the gender binary. Um, I won't get into that now, but like, it, yeah. I, 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 I'm evangelizing against that statement as a, as a bisexual trans woman. So anyway, going on. Um, the notion that these sorts of personal judgments that Laundry Los just said represent universal truths is highly problematic. For one thing, it de denies individual and cultural differences. For example, a contemporary cis woman might view the color pink as symbolizing submissiveness because she associates it with the passive and deferential role that she was socialized to inhabit as a young girl. But my perspective of the color pink is very different as a trans woman who happened to be socialized now. Rather than being something that was forced upon me, femininity was something that I naturally gravitated toward. And having to endure mass socialization, I was taught to repress or hide my femininity. And pink was a color that I was supposed to avoid like the plague. It was downright dangerous. The first time that I wore a pink t-shirt in public as a man was an act of defiance. But of course, the color pink is not inherently dangerous, nor is it inherently submissive. It's just the color. It's been around a lot longer than we've been talking about it. <laughs> On its own, it has no inherent meanings, but it begins to take on different meanings, completely different meanings, depending on what context it appears in and the beliefs and assumptions that are held by the person who's doing the perceiving and interpreting. Indeed, the notion that pink is for girls or that it symbolizes submissiveness is a modern Western invention that did not exist before um, the 19th century. And for a time in the early 20th century, many people associated pink with boys and masculinity because they viewed it as a, uh, quote, more decided and stronger color, whereas blue is deemed more delicate and dainty. So while many of us today viscerally experience pink as a profoundly feminine color, that's only because we're viewing it through the prism of our own unconsciously held double standards. Similarly, I would argue that expressions of gender sexuality more generally, whether they be feminine dress, or heterosexuality, or consensual BDM, or androgyny, or bisexuality, or what have you, do not have any fixed inherent meanings of their own. Rather, they garner meanings, um, they garner meanings based upon whatever cultural, ideological, or personally held double standards that we project onto them. If we believe that gender and sexual traits have fixed meanings, then we are likely to feel justified in encouraging or compelling others to only express the good traits, that is, do those that we personally deem moral, natural, or normal, and to outright avoid the bad traits, those we see as immoral, unnatural, or abnormal. In other words, fixed perspectives often lead us headlong, in headlong into the messy business of policing other people's genders and sexualities. Sometimes we police behaviors and traits that are already viewed as suspect and illegitimate in the culture at large. So in the previous examples, um, when we condemn bisexuality and consensual BDSM. When we do this, we're basically contributing to the marginalization of people who possess these traits. However, other times we condemn behaviors that are generally praised in the culture, in those examples, feminine dress and women and heterosexuality, while simultaneously praising the reciprocal behaviors that are culturally panned in those ex examples, androgyny and uh, homosexuality. So in other words, when we are in entrenched and fixed perspectives, we often reverse the double standards that we do not like, rather than eliminating them entirely. While I can certainly understand why a marginalized group might want to flip-flop the hierarchies that oppress them, for instance, by claiming that homosexuality is superior to heterosexuality and androgyny is more legitimate than conventional masculinity and femininity, in the end, such approaches only continue to perpetuate sexism and marginalization, albeit in somewhat modified forms. Often, activists who reverse double standards will claim that such maneuvers are necessary in order to subvert some kind of societal sexism. For example,